From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. With a $1 billion shortfall, no one would say the Providence pension system is in good shape, but after pension reform six years ago, how bad is it? A city council report calls the current situation, quote, a recipe for disaster, but the head of the Providence Firefighters Union says the sky isn't falling. This week on the first half of Newsmakers, Providence City Councilman Sam Zerrier, and on the second half, President of the Providence Firefighters Union, Paul Dowdy. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Ted Nisi is off this week, so filling in from WPRI.com, reporter Dan McGowan. And I'm very grateful, Dan, that you're here today because the topic we're going to be tackling is all things Providence. Our guest, as we said, is Councilman Sam Zerrier. Good to have you on the program. Thanks for having me. Uh, earlier this year, you announced you weren't seeking re-election. I want to get into why you made that decision and, and reflect a little bit on your two terms in office. But first, let's tackle the city pension plan. You were part of a working group that re-examine the city pension system. The report recommends getting the pension plan funded up to 60% in 10 years, which is very ambitious. It is currently just over 25% funded uh, as of, I believe, July 1st, June 1st, and it has taken some major reform to even get there. What are the two biggest proposals out of the working group to get the pension plan funded to 60% in just a decade? I wish there were only two tools needed. I to said do two this. biggest. <laughs> yeah, um, it's going to take. It's we had a list of like fifteen boxes right. to check off, and you're going to have to check off all fifteen of them in order to save the pension. Uh, one big item is is monetizing the water supply, but that's that's only um, that's only maybe a third of the problem. And in addition to that, there will be uh, ask uh, requests. Uh, for reforming the pension system itself. There will be requests from cities and uh, from nonprofits for greater contributions. We'll probably need help from the taxpayers. It's going to be an all hands on deck type of effort. I want to just touch on the water uh, supply board um, question because that, that comes up every once in a while, selling it or leasing the water supply board. Uh, as former mayor Angel Tavares uh, has said many times, if it were that easy, wouldn't it have been done already? And there are real legal questions about the city, uh, if the city even has the right to sell or lease the water supply board. How do you respond to that? Well, I've started researching that. and I'm actually hoping to write an article for the Bar Journal this summer, uh, since I'm not campaigning. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you go back to the history. And in 1926, when it was formed, um, the, uh, the city had the right to set water rates. And that continued, for instance, in 1969, the city was charging 25% less for water for Providence consumers than for the rest of the uh, rest of the users because everybody recognized Providence paid for this and Providence uh, therefore should be able to get some return on its investment. Um, then there was an effort to put it under the jurisdiction of the Public Utilities Commission in 1976, I believe. It went up to the Supreme Court and said, no, um, Providence has its own system. We set it up in 1926. Um, then the General Assembly changed the law, and they said, notwithstanding what we did before, now we're putting it under the jurisdiction of the Public Utilities Commission. And they had the absolute legal authority to do that, but as a Providence resident, I don't think it was fair to us, and I don't think it was, um, it, it was in keeping with the fact that we paid for the system. So I would say that, yes, as a legal matter, it would take the, uh, an act by the General Assembly to change the status quo. Um, but I think there's no question they have that authority if they choose to do it. But and it sounds like even just by doing the research, you acknowledge that it, you know, it's legally risky whether or not you can, you're going to get the green light to make that happen if, if the city decided to pursue that. It's not a sure thing. Well, I think that the city has gone to the General Assembly to seek legislation. And um, the General Assembly would have the authority, if it chose, to address the issues that, that uh, have been identified. So there, there's legal and then there's what's feasible politically, right? There seems to be very little appetite in the General Assembly right now to sell or lease, you know, allow the city the, the mechanism to do that kind of thing. Um, even on the city council, it, there seems to be a pretty big divide about whether you should, uh, whether the city should take this approach. So, I mean, how do you get this done just realistically as, a, if, forget, let's pretend it is legal and let's pretend there is something to, that this can happen. I mean, how, how, how do you convince the legislature to move on this? Well, number one, this is one of my biggest regrets about leaving the city council. I feel terribly that 
this issue with the pension, we did not make more progress while I was on the city council. And it is a very difficult problem. With that said, I think that um, if I were on the General Assembly and someone from Providence came to me with this, I would want to know, is this going to solve your problem or are you going to, have, are you going to come back later and ask for more? And I think that in order to make a good case to the General Assembly, Providence has to show this 15 boxes we were talking about before and show how this is a piece of a solution that will address all the problems. Because if, if Providence can address its pension problems, that will provide a benefit to everybody in the state. In response to the uh, report the council put out, the president of the Firefighters Union, Paul Dowdy, who's our guest on the second half of the program, said, quote, the plan is now taking in more than it pays out. It has turned a corner, and the funded ratio will grow, albeit slowly, as the years progress. Does he have that right? Um, uh, well, if, if we follow um, if, if we follow the uh, figures on the chart, the answer is yes. Um, however, um, that is uh, making certain assumptions about the city of Providence um, that I think um, are um, subject to question. So the first qu the, the, you know, if you read uh, the analysis that the fire uh, union prepared, one of the things they say is, well, uh, tax, incre tax revenues will increase and that'll pay for increase in the pension obligation. Um, if you look at the last 10 years, uh, tax revenues have increased at an annual rate of 1.44%. The pension obligation is going up by 3.5%. So that'll help a little bit, but it certainly won't take care of the whole issue. There are five other dynamic effects that I think need to be considered. Uh, number one, the, uh, there were 104 firefighters who retired between 2015 and 2017, earlier than the actuary projected. When the actuary does the next run, that's going to increase the pension obligation, it's going to increase the cost. Number two, the current model assumes an 8% rate of return. This is getting a little um, detailed for the viewers. But, and I but can't eight, so our viewers understand, 8% rate of return is what the market does, and that's what the city has set. as. But now the state has a lower assumed rate of return than the Correct. city does. So the, city, the state went through a very difficult period to get down from 8 to 7 percent, and that's considered yeah. the right number. Because that spikes the unfunded liability. Yeah, so that, that would add maybe 15 percent to uh, the cost of the pension. Uh, the third thing is that when the city went through stresses um, over the last decade, there were $70 million in reserves as of uh, 2009. Uh, we spent those through on our way to the fiscal hurricane. Our reserves are very limited. We don't have uh, we, we don't have the ability to deal with downturns in the economy. Um, the fourth thing is that there is a um, uh, one uh, billion dollar liability with uh, health benefits for retirees that we have to deal with. Uh, so all of those factors um, uh, make it more difficult to come up with the additional money every year um, to pay for the pension. So let's let's though paint a picture for the viewers, right? So in the current fiscal year, the one we're in right now, the city's going to pay out about eighty-three million dollars as its as its uh, arc payment for that goes into the pension system for retirees. There's a big kind of scare number that a lot of folks use that at the end of this, you know, after year after year after year of, of payments, that number is supposed to rise to about one hundred and seventy million dollars by twenty forty. In between there, though, at what point, if, if we remain on the current path, in your opinion, do we fall off the cliff? Is it 100 million? Is it, you know, when do you see us in, a, in a, the city of Providence in a situation where it will not be able to pay uh, its, its retirees or its, its payment to the system? Well, first of all, um, I'm hopeful that'll never occur. I'm hopeful that we will come up with ref reforms uh, so that we never face that. And, and I'm optimistic we will. Um, but if you went through the exercise of no reforms at all and you put in the 1.44% of growth in, in tax revenues, then um, by uh, 2029, um, from then to now, our pension obligation has gone up by $48 million. Our tax revenues have gone up by $54 million. So that's 89% of the additional taxes are going into the pension. And we've got expenses for education, public works, public safety, all these things. That's not sustainable. Um, the other thing, in, in, you know, you say, when is the tipping point? Is at some point um, when the taxes, when, when the city is unable to provide basic services to its citizens, um, people will be tempted to leave. And, you know, a very interesting data set right now is the firefighters. There was a time in the past when firefighters lived in Providence. 
um, right now very few of them do. Um, they've made a decision that it's better to live elsewhere, even though they work in Providence. And if we lose the middle class, if we lose businesses that, that choose not to locate here in Providence, that will accelerate our difficulties. You know, we probably have about three minutes left on this half. It, it, it goes by quickly. Um, so I want to shift, um, but, but, but very briefly, one thing we haven't even addressed is we're overdue for a recession nationally. How concerned or what do you think is going to happen with the city when we hit our next recession? It might not be as great as 2008, but um, recessions come and go. Absolutely. So what you had, first of all, it'll affect the stock market performance of the portfolio, which we is... might not hit the 8% or beyond. Right. Yeah, I mean, it might go in the other direction, which is, which is what happened to the state. Um, the second thing that'll happen is that um, we know the pension is going up by 3.5%, but the tax base may not keep up with it. T uh, property values may decline. So uh, that, that's absolutely uh, a concern, and that's why... Um, it's, uh, if you want to look at it as a dynamic issue, which I think is the right thing to do, you have to consider all the downsides as well as the upsides. You, you've served two, uh, two terms on the city council and got to serve under two different mayors, Mayor Tavares, of course, between 2011 and 2014, and then now Mayor Lorza. Working with both of them, what do you see as the biggest difference between Mayor Lorza and Mayor Tavares? Well, I think that um, both of them came in with a background of being a municipal judge. And um, in my opinion, a judge's role is to figure out a problem and write down an answer. And uh, what Mayor Tavares realized was that that's not enough to be a mayor. You can figure out the best answer in the world, but you have to go around and then beg with everybody to agree with you. And he did a magnificent job with that in the face of the city's financial liquidity crisis of 2011 and 12. Um, I actually sat down with him in 2014. I said, is it going to be as easy for the next mayor without a crisis like that. And he said, no, actually it's going to be harder because people won't um, be willing to get together because they'll think that they can put the problems off. And that's the, I think that that change condition has been um, a challenge for Mayor Lorza. He's, he's been trying to do the right thing in a number of areas, but it's harder to mobilize people when they don't see the urgency that existed in uh, 2011. So are you saying that Mayor Tavares is a little better at outreach than the current mayor is? Well. I'm saying uh, that he did a better job uh, partly because perhaps he had an easier hand to play with. I see. Um, you know, they say uh, never let a, a crisis go to waste. Right, right. <laughs> um, Councilman, we have about a minute left. So you, uh, as we said, um, you sent a letter to constituents in May, I believe, that you weren't seeking re-election? Yes. Why did you make that decision? Uh, there were two parts to it. Um, the first was to give voters a choice. Uh, when I saw re-election in 2014, I didn't have an opponent. Um, I have certain skills, I have certain priorities, um, and other, um, other colleagues on the city council have different skills and different priorities. My predecessors had different skills and different priorities, so I thought it would be good for people to have a choice. The other piece of it is that after the 2018-22 uh, term, or 2019-22 term, there's going to be term limits. Um, eight people on the city council right now are seeking re-election who will be subject to term limits. The mayor is seeking re-election, and if he's re-elected, he'd be subject to term limits. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it would be good. I would have been subject to term limits if I had sought re-election. I thought it would be good for the city and, and for our neighborhood if we had someone in there who would not be subject to term limits, provide continuity, and also perhaps gain some seniority in the 2023-26 20, uh, term if that person is re-elected. All right. Providence City Councilman Sam Zerrier, thank you very much for thank joining you. us on the program. When we come back, the other side of the pension coin, our guest, President of the Providence Firefighters Union, Paul Dowdy. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Ted Nisi is off this week, so filling in is Dan McGowan, reporter from WPRI.com. Our guest on the second half is the president of the Providence Firefighters Union, Paul Dowdy. Paul, good to have you back on the program. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Dan. Uh, uh, we started with pensions with Councilman Zerrier. We're going to start with you. Uh, despite pension reform in 2012, the funding ratio on the pension plan is still very bleak, and you acknowledge that in your rebuttal to the council's report. Right now, can you look your membership in the eye? and promise their pension will be there in its current form on the current path. Yes, if the city sticks to the plan that they adopted in 2013, uh, and barring bankruptcy, which this, only the city controls, 
I can look in the eye and look myself in the eye. Uh, I'm entering pension age myself. It's something that I consider and pay close attention to, but the answer to that question is yes. So one of your big ideas, and I, and I remember hearing a lot about this in 2011 with the state, is uh, you think that you know, to avoid getting to the very scary um, one hundred and seventy two million dollar a year payment by twenty forty one that the city would never do that because they would re amortize the debt, which means basically remortgage the debt in the uh, the council's report, they said that that would be viewed negatively by ratings agencies that give cities a grade, mm -hmm. thereby making it very difficult or impossible for the city to borrow money. money. How do you respond to that? I, th I think there's a distinction there. One is to com do a complete reamortization for the another 30-year term, which is the max that's uh, provided under the Gatsby rules. But what I'm suggesting is that we flatten out the tail end where it does re uh, go up to 170, because you'll have a situation where, in, I think it's 2037, you would pay 170 toward the arc, and then the very next year you'd pay 20 million. So it doesn't make sense to have that sharp of a cliff when you're managing the entire city finances. So I'm thinking of a, a much shorter time advised by the actuary and other financial experts of 10 to 15 years on the tail end so that we can just kind of merge those highs and lows and make it more But, but even. You're, you're avoiding part of my question. I mean, don't you, do you acknowledge that the ratings agencies would be like, well, they're just kicking that can down the road? I don't think so. I think that they're going to recognize that that's a, um, a smart way to level that off and smoothing. It's one of the aspects that actuaries use all the time when they're looking at returns. So it's a common tool that financial uh, experts use. So I don't, I don't believe there'd be any negative um, result from an action like that. You, you said that, that right now you can look your, your colleagues in the eye and say their pension will be there, your pension will be there, um, as long as the city does sort of what it's supposed to do. Right. Um, but does that kind of assume that right now in Providence things are good? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your commercial rate is, is pretty high, your roads and schools are crumbling. So don't you think that's sort of a little bit of a low bar for good currently? It is a little bar, but it's, it's a, if you look at the trend line from where we were, we can look at no taxes have gone up in four years. Uh, the city's looking like it's going to have another surplus for the first time in many years. Uh, it's made the pension arc payment reliably since 2013. So I think if we look at all those factors and then just take a look downtown, uh, there is development on the uprise. Uh, very interesting meeting the other night regarding a new proposal. Um, so I think when you look at all those things, the things that we can control, that the city's moving in the right direction. But people would say, I mean, certainly developers, speaking of developers, right, They every single one of them comes to the city and says, we can't afford your commercial tax rate, we need a tax break, right? The, certainly homeowners complain, landlords all often complain. You drive on the roads in Providence and you say, these things have a lot of potholes. So. Right now, things may be okay, but that doesn't seem to be something that residents really like. Well, it kind of goes to populism, right? Does anybody want their taxes to go up? I don't. Uh, it's a choice that the council and the government of Providence makes on where they want to spend their money. In 2013, all the parties involved, including the previous guest, agreed at the time with the pension settlement. And here we are five years later. Um, and we just heard the councilman say, you know, never let a crisis go to waste. So a lot of this report, in my opinion, is trying to manufacture another crisis. If we look at the, the indices that were, were mentioned in 2013, they're almost repeated verbatim that they're going to crowd out other functions, that there's better choices, potholes, infrastructure, schools. That was the same premise used to bring all the stakeholders together, and yeah, they haven't but, changed. You, you know, Paul, you, you might be a voice of reason here, but why should the people of Providence uh, have any faith in what the unions say mm -hmm. when uh, they pushed and received pretty, I think you could say objectively, outrageous benefits in 1989 um, You know that just torched the funding ratio. We're talking 5 to 6 percent compounding COLAs. Those are gone now, mm -hmm. increasing the minimum pension while lowering the years of service. Then the Employee Controlled Retirement Board was handing out disability pensions left and right. I mean, why should anyone have confidence in what the, the labor unions say when that's what happened and put us in the, it put the city in that position. I think they should, should take whatever the city says and the union said with some skepticism. And if we want to go to a third party or take a look at it themselves, but what we can't, what we can say did happen is those pension reforms were made. I, in particular, was part of that, and I made them willingly. Um, did they go all the way the city wanted? No, but that's the kind of the 
the, the nature of making a deal is we give up some, they give up some. Why aren't firefighters living here, as Councilman Zuria pointed out? Is that a testament to maybe how things, as Dan pointed out, aren't as rosy as, as you want to say? No, I think it, when you look historically, there was a residency requirement, so the firefighters had no choice. Mm. Um, the residency requirement. And that went away and the numbers yeah, dropped. Sure. Uh, we are seeing an uptick, though. So if we're going to look at trends more recently, uh, there's m many more firefighters living in the city than there has been over the past five to ten years. One of the things the working group uh, recommended, and it's something that gets sort of thrown about in City Hall a lot, is uh, as an obvious choice for, for a potential solution to the pension, or one solution is uh, extending the current freeze or suspension of cost of living adjustments for retirees. That's supposed to go through uh, 2021, it will come back in 22. Uh, do you see a chance that that retirees, and, and I imagine unions would be involved in this too, will agree to it when there's already a, a legal you know, uh, agreement in place? Do you think you can lift that agreement and extend it out further? No, I don't think there's any way absent bankruptcy, which I don't think anybody thinks is even plausible, never mind a, a good tactic or bargaining strategy. So no, I don't, I don't see it changing. So you don't consider that an option? No, not at this point. It could be reopened in a collective bargaining agreement. Is that what you're saying? And five, like five years from now, it could be reexamined. Four years, yes. So it could be part of a change for current employees. Retirees can, right. which is what Dan's court, talking about. Yeah, you can't reach court, backward. They can only negotiate right. uh, for themselves. Uh, but I don't see it changing uh, for retirees, and I do think there's some room for active if they supported it. I want to talk politics real quick, if sure. I could. Uh, John Carnavale is running again despite a criminal case that is still pending, that he lied to election officials and tax officials about where he lived. Uh, he's previously gotten the su support of public safety unions. Will he this time? Uh, we have a, a, a process for endorsements, uh, and we haven't uh, done anything. We're focused with uh, reps or senators. We're focusing on the uh, council races, which are much more Will important. you focus on reps and senators? We will. Okay. So when I have that process, we will let you know. And, and that, him that know. process is membership votes? Uh, the executive board votes and makes that decision. You're on the executive board? Yes. Are you going to give John Carnavale your support? I want to hear what he has to say. Uh, in terms of his outstanding criminal matters, I think they weigh into that conversation. And we're not going to overlook it. Um, well, that's at the heart of my question, sure, obviously, sure, right? You know, yeah. we're talking about public safety yep. unions and a criminal case brought mm -hmm. on by law enforcement on this. Do you think he should be even considered until that case where he could be acquitted? Right, very, very much so. Yeah. Um, no, but it, obviously it's a, it's a big factor. Is it the only factor? No. Um, I'm not, not happy with his uh, opponent. We haven't had really any relationship with him. So it's, in elections, a lot of people like to look at perfect candidate or ideal candidate, but that's not the reality. It's this guy or that woman, whatever the case may be. So we only have two choices or do nothing. And that may be exactly what Actually, we you have three choices in this case. There are, there are three <laughs> candidates in that race. But that's, that's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, as Councilman Zuru, this, uh, you have worked under many mayors, mm -hmm. uh, including the last two, Mayor Lorza and Mayor Tavares. What do you see as the biggest difference between Mayor Lorza and Mayor Tavares? Well, it's, it's no secret that I was a, a much bigger fan of Mayor Tavares and his staff. And um, that was because of, I thought, the approach. They were always honest brokers with us, no surprises, uh, allowed us to see all the background data that we wanted whenever an issue related to both pension, health care reform, or contractual reform. And we haven't seen that with, with Mayor Loza. Uh, he kind of sandbagged us on the change to three shifts. I was never given an opportunity to even discuss that with him before he made that change. It was a change that ended up costing $10 million and an unknown impact on the pension, which nobody has researched yet. Uh, I think it's part of the due diligence, both related to the pension subjects that we're talking about today. But since then, nobody knows what the impact on the pension is. And I think it's going to be a big one. And then the question becomes, I told you this was going to happen. I warned you not to do it. You did it anyways. Should the union bear responsibility to fix that piece of it? Uh, we have a little over a minute left. Uh, you've been union president since 2004. I believe I have that right. Um, I'll say it because you won't, but that is an exhausting job. Your phone is constantly going off, and you have to appear in shows like this and <laughs> answer hard really. questions. Yeah, oh boy, <laughs> you have a low bar for a highlight. Um, after uh, 14 years, I'm sure it all, the j position also comes with its fair share of, of enemies. A minute left here. Um, 
how long do you see yourself in this position as president of the firefighters union? It's an elected position, but how long will you keep seeking uh, this position? The union election process uh, is in September, so at this point, it's it's unlikely that I'll run again. I'll leave a little light that uh, perhaps I may run, and I, but the final decision will be made uh, the third Tuesday in September. What's giving you pause? Uh, I don't have a great relationship with the mayor, but we do have a contract. I think it's a good time to leave. There's some consistency there. Um, I think the e-board that would succeed me is uh, well-rounded, and that four years of, of time, presumably without an impact, um, would be a good time for them to plane off and, and get ready for the next set of negotiations. So for, for all the factors that you look at as a leader, I think the, the union's in a good spot. And I've, I've done my time. All right, Paul Dowdy, thanks very much for joining us. For Dan McGowan, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.